This is a Hot Pie Original. Hi, and welcome to The Amy Edwards Show. I'm your host, Amy Edwards. So excited for today's episode. We have our first guest. He is such a badass and has such an amazingly powerful story. Can't wait to share it. It's Justin Wren. So stay tuned for that. But first, let's get into our intro and talk habits today. So of course, I'm thinking about habits. It's the start of 2021 and we're all, you know, ready for the new year. Everybody's always cliche, busting out new habits and all that. And and it feels like a time of rebirth. And I think that's really my main focus with this episode is just to talk a little bit like with Justin and with myself and with you about rebirth and transforming in new ways, leaving behind the old and allowing ourselves to come into something new. I hope that resonates with you. It always does for me. I'm, I'm a total cliche when it comes to the new year. I'm like, well, I'm a list person, first of all, and I love making goals and checking things off. So I really enjoy the fresh start and just the like mnemonic device of a new year or even a new, you know, moon cycle. (laughs) I'll embrace any of it. And a new year is just a big one for me. And it always has been. So, uh, you know, when I talk about these things too, and these habits and the rebirth, all of it, I'm not just talking about it, to talk about it for you or for the show. I need to remind myself of these things. These are things that I'm constantly working on. And some of it is stuff that I want to share with you too, that I wish I had had sooner that I've had to develop over years. And so hopefully we can just cut to the chase a little bit more because I'm all about efficiency. You know, I'm all about making the most of our time and transforming with as little effort as possible. Can it be easy? (laughs) Right? Does it have to be hard work? Not necessarily. Right? At least I don't think so right? So transformation and rebirth. I got naked last week. If you haven't watched that episode, please tune into it. I was just so happy to start something new. And I just really tapped into when we start something new and are we doing it wrong or those times we feel like we're doing it wrong and we're not, right? There is no doing it wrong. So it's all about this remembering and it goes with the rebirth, right? This fear, rebirth, darkness, light, transformation. It's about changing who we're being. And I read this quote, I didn't bring the book, but it is from Jen Sincero. She wrote, you are a badass. And this one is from her book, you are a badass at making money. And I read this just the other day. I usually have about 10 books going at once and I'll read like a page or two a day. That's one of my regular habits when I can today. I didn't because I ran out of time because I was sleeping and I needed to catch up on my sleep. And that is Okay, sleep is a priority. We're going to get to that though. So this that I wanted to share first, this is, she was talking about money, but I just thought this was reflective of anything that we want to transform. She says, when you change who you're being, you're basically killing off your old identity, which completely freaks your subconscious self out. Change hurls you into the unknown and puts you at risk for all sorts of loss. And of course, all sorts of think unthinkable awesomeness, which is why it brings your biggest fears to the surface. Right. So much of it about change is about fears. It's not only like our fears of who we're going to become and what could happen, but it's our fears too, that we project that other people are going to think about us or other people legitimately think about them. I've had plenty of people say stuff to me when I change and it makes you pause for a minute out of fear, whatever. Um, And you know, Justin today, Justin that we're going to talk to, he is so incredibly amazing and the things that he's overcome. And he shares his story of transformation and rebirth coming out of addiction, coming out of suicide attempt and what he overcame throughout this whole ordeal. And he also talks about a vision that he had during breath work, that same breath work that I talked about last week. If you haven't heard that, I encourage you to listen to it and my revelation. And then we'll talk more with him today about his revelation and the rebirth that he felt during that time. And he is a MMA heavyweight fighter with Bellator. He's also the founder of Fight for the Forgotten. He's worked extensively with pygmy tribes in Africa, and he is known as the Big Pygmy. So you can follow him there on Instagram at the Big Pygmy. And he is about defeating hate with love and just a constant work in progress to that goal. And it's incredibly inspiring in the interview today. So I'm super stoked to share that. And I think that he really gets into finding new life in the now, 
right? And allowing ourselves to transform and change, which is so beautiful. And as we look to at the beginning of the year, I did a podcast the other day with Ali Waddell, who has the ketamine clinic here in Austin called Illuma, that I did my ketamine journey with last year. And she even brought up this whole thing. She kind of laughed about it too, about this whole thing about the new year and how we all like want to implement every single habit right away. And it just got me thinking about how many times I've done that and wanted to implement every single habit right away. Right. But it's not really about that. It's about loving yourself enough to make the choices that are going to baby step you to just a better you in the short term. And that has long-term benefits. So uh, I personally have been building those habits. I really got serious about it during the pandemic too, just about tracking my habits and about choosing them from a place of self-love. I dated this guy late last year and he was like, you do too much. (laughs) And I was like, I don't know, you know, what's too much? I'm sure I do a lot less than like, I don't know, fucking... Jack that owns Twitter or something like that. Doesn't he do all kinds of stuff? There's people, there's a whole scale of it, right? You can do a hardcore lifestyle or you can do simple daily practices that you try to implement more often than not. I'm not about being hard on myself with all this stuff, but I am about thinking, okay, I love myself enough. I'm going to do it out of that love for myself. I have this app called Think Up, which I love. And you can record your own affirmations within it and then listen back. You can categorize them differently. And one of the ones that I have in here is, I live according to my value. I value myself and the daily actions I choose to take reflect that value and love that I have for myself. Right? Because if you look at it that way, then you know, maybe you're just building self-love instead of holding yourself accountable for all these things that you have to do every single day. Like just try to do them more often than not. And just look at your day like, you know what? Was I coming from a place of love for myself? Mm. And sometimes the answer is, uh, I don't know, you know, but maybe that self-love sometimes is giving yourself a break and, um, you know, eating a bag of Lay's sour cream and onion potato chips while watching Netflix. And that's okay. That can be a place of self-love. Sometimes you need a little of that, right? It's not about being this hardcore thing because I do that too. Like, uh, Lord knows I do. I need French fries, right? So let's talk about my daily habits. So I have this thing, James Clear has this, um, he has such a good book too. I don't know why the name of it's escaping me. Um, But this is his habit tracker journal and someone gifted it to me and I love it. It's got a list in the back. So of course I love it. Uh, and you can list off like here, this, this was when I did quarantine habits and you can check off every day that you do them. See, I did. I don't know if you can see it. If you're watching on YouTube, um, there's, there's holes, there's empty parts. And, uh, you know, it was exercise, yoga, stretch, guitar, meditate, clean something. Cause I was trying to clean shit out cause it was the pandemic. Um, you know, care about my dog, (laughs) spend time with my dog, read, write 30 minutes, walk, care for my skin, do some affirmations and Reiki, um, track my food. I was working on building that habit because I'd never really been dedicated to that. Sleep for eight hours and pay attention to my kids and their learning. And Oh, and, and a breathing exercise and a cold shower. So I know it is a lot. I could see how someone would judge me and be like, that's a lot, but I don't do them all every day. I don't always get it all done. And that's just fine with me. I've actually, since working to build those, I've let myself just relax a little bit into it. And this week I haven't done, I've, I've been a little bit slacking off and, you know, it's the beginning of the year and that's just okay. So what, you know, so what? Just the point is just trying to build them and sleep. Let me just add about sleep. I will forego all the rest of it for good sleep, which is what I did this morning. I needed more sleep. And so I got it. That just is important, you know, and it's so healing sleeping. So anyway, we will get more into sleep science as we progress on this show for sure, because I'm, I'm an addict. And, uh, you know, um, I also wanted to encourage this book, Turning Pro by Stephen Pressfield. Any of his work is so incredibly good at building solid habits and 
in Turning Pro, he talks about what Turning Pro means. And one of the pages, I'm going to read some more. I'm going to read some more because this is all just speaking to me right now. So he talks about how everything becomes more simple when we turn pro. We order our days in such a way that we overcome the fears that have paralyzed us in the past. And we plan our activities in order to accomplish an aim. And even if that's something simple like self-love, I think that that's really profound, you know? And procrastination, which I suffer from on a regular basis, is fear-based. I was studying this just recently, and it is based in fear for me, at least a lot of times. Yeah, it can be laziness too. It can be the chips and the Netflix, but it's also based in, you know, fear of doing it wrong. Like you feel like you need to prepare, you need to learn X, Y, Z, like we talked about last week before you can do it. And Allie and I talked about that on that ketamine uh, discussion that we had. It is on my Instagram too. If you want to catch the whole episode, it's on my IGTV. And she um, addressed starting her own show and her own fears that were holding her back. And she was just, she said she dragged her feet on it for a whole year, which who hasn't done that? You know, are you writing your novel? Are you dragging your feet on that? Cause you need to learn a certain thing or, or, you know, I'm putting that in quotes because we don't, you just need to start. You just need to develop the habits and just start, right? <laughs> just sit down and do it. Five minutes. Set your timer for five minutes. I used to do that all the time. I would just set my timer for five minutes. Meditation too, five minutes, three minutes sometimes. And I consider that a success, right? Then you're like, yeah, I did that. I love myself. I did that for myself. Yay, go me. Hug yourself, <laughs> right? Anyway, it's a beautiful, beautiful thing. So this year, I think I'm just working on being really present and intentional for this show and more present and intentional in my life in general and with myself, with my relationships, with my kids. And, you know, what can that bring, right? When we're really living like that and living in the higher vortex. Yeah. So how are you showing up in your own life? How are you showing up for your own self-love? I challenge you to really take a look at that. Maybe spend a little time writing on it. You know, I do. I write all the time. I don't always journal. I've said this. Um, I write for this show, so I'll get a lot of thoughts out. But however you want to put it down, put it on your Instagram, send it to a friend, put it in your notes app, write it in a journal. doesn't matter. But maybe you can get it out a little bit. All right. So now we are going to move on to our interview. I'm so excited to bring this as our first interview to this show. Um, it's Justin Wren. Again, follow him on Instagram at The Big Pygmy. He's a heavyweight MMA fighter and the founder of fightfortheforgotten.org. You can go there to donate to his amazing organization, which I'm sure you're going to want to after you hear his story. So let's go on and get to know Justin right now. And thank you so much for being here. Stick around to the end because at the end, I didn't ask Justin about his habits and just I spaced out, I guess, during the interview. We had such a great chat and um, or deep conversation. It's not a chat. What am I talking about? It's a deep conversation. And so I sat down with him for a few minutes just to talk about his daily habits. And that is something that we're going to include at the very end in the wrap up with me as well. So stick around for all that right now. Okay, I'm so excited, you guys, to welcome Justin Wren. The Big Pygmy is what he is also known as on Instagram. And he is a 14-year pro MMA fighter with a 15-2 and record, 10-time Texas state champ, two-time national Greco-Roman wrestling champ. You uh, took your bullying from way back when and turned it into defeat hate with love, hmm. which is your message to the world, right? Yeah, that's our vision statement. That's your vision statement. Beautiful and simple. I love it. You are the founder of fightfortheforgotten.org. You have Heroes in Waiting, which is a bullying prevention curriculum that you founded last year. And you've done a TED Talk. You're an author of Fight for the Forgotten. You have a documentary coming out. What am I forgetting? Wow. Uh, <laughs> you've been on Rogan eight times. Yeah. I mean, like, and you know, you spent a year, right, in mm -hmm. Uganda or yep. the Congo? Both. Both. Uganda and Congo. Man. Close to two years now. Uh, but one year at one time. Lived there in the rainforest. Uh yeah, I slept on the dirt. That was my bed. And the fire was my blanket. And uh, the twig and leaf huts that were only about four or five foot tall, uh, that was home. And so, Aren't you like 32? 33. How old are you? You're 33. I'm 33, yeah. <laughs> I mean, like when we met, I, yeah. I, I read that the other yesterday when I was researching and stuff. And I was like, no 
way. Like, I don't know how you packed all this in, but that's super impressive. And I'm just hey, so grateful that you ended up in Austin today yeah. and wanted to do this because you are the first guest here. And yeah. I'm just like, so stoked. Well, thank you. It means a lot to me. So um, you're incredible. And I love being here with you and sharing the space. And thank you. it's going to be a great conversation. And I, I am honored. I'm, I'm humbled uh, to be here for the first I'm honored too. kind of guest. And well, so you know, you, you. I, we might as well cover a little bit about how we met, but before sure. we get to that, before we get to that too, uh, one thing that I'm trying to go into this with, with every guest. And right. I talked about this on my first episode is like setting an intention. So mm. like, if you were to set an intention for what we're doing right now, mine would be definitely to lift your message as mm. high as I possibly can mm. and to share your message, which is so beautiful and reverberates out in the world. So wow. what, what would you create as an intention right now? To share love. To share love. Yeah. I um, love that. Because yeah, I, I've seen it. I've seen it do remarkable things. Mm -hmm. Um, and self-love, I guess that's a new journey I'm on oh, of healing. Me too. But, right. Me too. So I, but yeah, share love, put love and compassion in action. Um, for me, it's knockout bullying worldwide, but also just sharing my truth and message raw and real yeah. and, um, almost get into the, the nitty gritty stuff that people normally, I, I try to be an open book. So try to just be vulnerable and share. Um, but yeah, it, fighting's been nuts. That's been an incredible part of my life, but the joy has come from and fulfillment has come from fighting for people. Mm -hmm. um, I mean, one's cool. The other one's great. And so um, I want to, I want to help people. And um, yeah, so I guess the intention for this, thank you for helping me share my message, but it's not even my message, right? Just to share love. Right. Uh, it's what, just what the message. Yeah. <laughs> right. right. I love that. When do you find spaces where it's hard like you get challenged in those compassion, like finding the compassion and the love, like, hmm. you know, do you find those? Yes, absolutely. I it, do. Uh, it can be hard to love difficult people. Mm -hmm. Right. And so that's precisely what I'm getting at. Yeah. It's hard to love difficult people. And, but oftentimes that's the best time to do it. Yeah. Um, it's the people that need it the most. And so just like the saying hurt people, hurt people. I mean, I see that with bullying. I see that growing up. I see that with a lot of different stuff, but Loved people, love people. And, and healed, you said in one of your posts, yeah, healed people, healed healed people, healed people. Healed people. And I, I love that. that. Malibu. Um, just, just felt it come over me and shared it with someone that I think's helping a lot of people. Mm -hmm. And I think it's just the tip of the iceberg. His name's Jason and incredible dude. Um, I'm getting to perform the wedding for him and his, his fiance. Oh, really? Uh, Megan. And Are you ordained now? I'm, I'm about to be, I guess. Uh -huh, sweet. <laughs> just added to the list, <laughs> just, I guess. I know, right? right? No, uh, ordained. Um, mm -hmm. no, I, I don't know how to do that, but, um, it's been nuts to see so many incredible relationships come into my life recently, mm -hmm. you being one of them. And I'm really grateful for that. And so I, I, I don't know why I share that about Jason, except for, I'm starting to see that in, in people that I come to know and love, but also just people that I come to, to meet and greet, I guess, where I'm like, man, that person's awesome. Yeah. You know what, what, how, how can I help or how can we help each other? Right. Pull the greatness out of one another. And so Ooh, I like that. Yeah. Identify mm -hmm. that and someone see it, call it out in them um, and speak it. You know, and he, yeah. I, I feel like recently what I've learned through fit for service and just the tribe that we're in is like when you think something nice or kind or good, say it, speak it. Me too. You know, I had like lessons around like the moments where I held back. I was like, I learned real quick that I shouldn't. Mm. And, um, and so I just started like going with my gut and like saying things mm. a lot quicker. And I was so happy every single time it brought something that needed to be done and just yeah. something beautiful. Yeah. Yeah. So let's talk about that. So that's how we met in fit for service. Mm -hmm. We connected one day because it was this really powerful divine feminine and masculine work that we were doing. And they were making everyone step forward when you think that the other sex doesn't understand or doesn't experience, hmm. is that how you would phrase it? It doesn't experience the same things you experience. Yeah. And we would step forward in these really intense questions like bullying. Have you been mm -hmm. bullied? Have you ever been the bully? Have you, you know, been sexually assaulted? Yeah. I mean, body I can't, image, body shame, body image, Bobby. I mean, like it ran the gamut mm -hmm. of hard questions, a lot of tears, lots of tears. Yeah. 
And you and I really looked at each other mm-hmm. and it's about seeing each other in yeah. those spaces. And we really had a moment where we saw each other and I'm so grateful for that. Yeah, me too. Yeah. It was a special time and connection. It, um, it was. And it was. I was curious too, like as we start talking today, I want to get into like your epiphanies and the sober visions that we've talked about. Um, But I also wanted to touch on like the feminine and masculine Mm -hmm. and with all that you do. And did that work? Like did doing those kind of exercises with women, did that change like how you view? Because, you know, men fighting, that seems like part of your role. Like how Mm -hmm. do you see it for someone like me? Like what do you, what do you tell the women in the, in the tribe and things like that? Well, I guess I'm I'm learning all this new lingo and uh, like a divine feminine, me feminine too. and masculine. Me like, too. That's all new to me in the last like month. So, <laughs> me too. Uh, Actually, six it's, weeks, I think it's like, months, like kind of trending right yeah, now. Okay. Like I think okay. it's just this year. I feel like it's really come into yeah. like it's own. I thought I just discovered it. I was like, whoa. <laughs> well, uh, yeah, but anyways, uh, yeah. I, I, uh, I, I'm, I'm learning this. So I guess I could try to articulate it, but um. Well, I can share my own story yeah. and, and I can share with you like our moment connecting. Um, for me growing up being bullied, I felt stripped of that masculinity. Um, like I wasn't good enough, strong enough. I mean, I can't defend myself. I can't defend others. Um, and that gave you like for a something young, to prove like a chip on your shoulder. No, not think, at first. Or? It no? made me timid and made me uh, really withdrawn, isolated. Mm hmm. Um, and I, I just, I cowered down a lot until I found wrestling. And when I found the sport of wrestling, uh, to me, it was like a human chess match and an MMA and those guys, I mean, it was pretty cool combining at the time, 13 years old, seeing boxers going there against wrestlers or jujitsu guys going against kickboxers or taekwondo versus sumo or crazy stuff back (laughs) in the day. And so it drew me in, but I thought these guys don't get bullied. And so I need to lean into this. Mm-hmm. This is my outlet, my purpose, my passion to transform into someone completely different uh, that I could approve of, I guess, or feel worthy or Ugh, acceptance yeah, yeah, yeah. and identity and all that. And so there's a lot packed in there. Yeah. But for me mm-hmm. now, over the last 10 years, especially have my life changed in 2011 um, in the Congo and going back ever since um, is knowing one, seeing those fathers and how great of men they are. Um, how they provide literally by hunting and gathering or by being slaves Um, and the way that they care for one another. Mother's roles there, they're so nurturing, but at the same time, they're also warriors as well. Um, And uh, for the men though, even though they're warriors, they're, they're laughing with their children, they're hugging their wives, holding their hands, being tender. So they're, they're tender warriors. Mm -hmm. And I think that that, is hopefully where we're all headed towards where we can be both lover and fighter. Well, we all embody all of that, right? And I know that in women, we will shy away sometimes Mm. from our warrior spirit and and the more masculine things. And that's been hard for me because I've been trying to lean into my feminine more in the last year, but it's about embracing those other parts of ourselves too. And I think it's probably harder for men to embrace their feminine than women to embrace, you know, their masculine. Yeah, maybe. Um, no, I agree with that. Uh, there's more cultural like pressure on men oh, to, for sure. to, right. to suck it up, be a mm-hmm. man, grow a pair, or I mean, right. just different stuff. All like the little that, things right? that yeah, can suck go with it up, that. you know. <laughs> um, and always don't cry, kind yeah. of shit like that. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Um, I don't know why I just thought of this. I had a pee wee football coach, right? And this is a, uh, he'd come out and if you were hurt, your knee was hurt, he'd go, Is it your left knee, your right knee, or your weenie? I've never said that, wow. anymore, but it makes me laugh <laughs> as a kid. And uh, never share that. I don't know why I flashed back to that, but he would make it, you know, funny. And and he wasn't as tough as the other coaches that would say, suck it up, get up, mm-hmm. stop crying, um, things like that, you know. And for me growing up now, I know, or, or the last 10 years, like really this journey of being like from early 20s to early 30s, it's been profound seeing that some of the times women have had the most impact or powerful moments for me in my life is whenever they did take up kind of that warrior side and they fought for me when I couldn't fight for myself. When was that? Um, What was that? Rehab. When I went to rehab. Yeah. All right. Let's talk about Um, it. My mom, some of the people on our board, Susan Stewart, who's like a second mom to me. Mm -hmm. She's our operations manager. She was my 
volunteer for a while, then my assistant, then she was our operations manager and we hired her and her husband. Um, and they're like spiritual parents to me, Jim and Susan. Okay. And they've really held fight for the forgotten and even me together, not maybe not held me together, but like came around side me whenever I needed to go to, uh, rehab, which this will be my second time. I think ever sharing this story. Okay. Um, I went earlier this year. Uh, May 15th through August 15th. Wow. And so it was 90 days. And it was a battle that I've been fighting since I was 19, actually 17. So 15 years. And a battle with? With drugs, okay. uh, with Oxycontin. Okay. Um, Oxy and Xanax and drinking some and, and pot, but really it was the pills and the booze. But um, it would be somewhere I was free from basically 10 years. I had these four or five really hard relapses in 10 years. And so what did a relapse was, look like? Uh, 60 days or 30 days, or uh, it was being a missing person for basically eight weeks. Oof. And then this was when I was 23. So 10 years ago, I got a voicemail from my best friend saying, I can't believe you missed my wedding. <gasps> I can't believe my best man didn't show up. Wow. And so I was, I was wrecked 10 years ago and I should have gone to treatment then, but I had a spiritual experience that I say, like, just woke me up. It, it, it loved the hell out of me and blessed the mess out of me so that I can do that for others. I hope. And yeah. so, um, but in this year, my mom, our board, um, Ashley Hoggett on our board and, Susan, I mean, they basically said what I've already, I think, mentioned, which was, um, they said, Justin, it's your life mission to put love and compassion in action and to fight for people. Now as a board, it's time for us to put love and compassion in action and to fight for you and to come alongside you, um, not just stand behind you, but stand beside you and in front of you with a shield and uh, to protect you. And, um, you know, I'd gone through a divorce, which was really hard. Mm -hmm. um, and which was actually, I say it's really hard. I, I don't think there's an easy divorce out there, right? I've done it twice. Yeah. And uh, I, I certainly haven't found the easy yeah. way. <laughs> well, the I hear silver, that sometimes there yeah. are, but. <laughs> well, I think the silver lining is that mine might be one of the kindest that's been done. Congratulations. Thank you. Yes. Um, we went through counseling for it. Um, I mean, we went two years before that. And then the last six months was just yeah. being counseled on how to get a divorce. And so, which is hard in itself, mm -hmm. right? Because we wanted it to work. Um, yeah, there's some real lows in a divorce that you just yeah. like, don't see coming. And then, yeah, so it's yeah, kind of yeah. everything happened all at once where, mm -hmm. um, the divorce happened in January. COVID was right around the corner. I got really sick. Potentially it was COVID. I was in LA and New York and then I got sick for like three weeks and wow. so I'm three rounds of antibiotics and, um, yeah. And then, and then a little girl named Fina that I know and love and have for seven, well, seven, eight years. She was 14 years old. Um, and a pygmy girl who a man that's a, a real mentor in my life adopted her. He's an incredible man. And we were trying to get her out of the Congo and into Uganda to get her lung taken out, um, or a lung transplant, whichever was going to work. But she had a crazy infection. She had tuberculosis when I met her seven years ago when she was seven years old. Uh -huh. Um, and we got her out of Congo did a kind of a rescue mission, kind of like they did for me when I had malaria and almost died. Um, someone came from Uganda, got me, brought me to Uganda. So we did the same thing with her, but we took her to a hospital on the border of Congo, or, uh, yeah, in Uganda, then in the capital city. And then we were taking her to the, the biggest city and she died in transport. And um, so that rocked me. And then kind of my best friend's wife, um, what was it five years ago? Um, 2014, she was poisoned um, and almost died. Well, she's had complications ever since. And in, in, uh, in March, I believe, maybe April, but um, she died. Oh my um, God. And so it was just like, boom, boom, boom. Whereas like divorce, lost Fina, lost El Nice. Just the grief, um, the amount of yeah, grief. Tons of grief. And then um, I thought, you know, uh, being sober over four years and having some real wins under my belt. And then all of a sudden it all happens at once, then COVID, then lockdown, then mm -hmm. 
wondering about the nonprofit. How is it going to be um, that people were trying to impact? Um, and I thought I could just have a joint. Uh, it's not a big deal to a lot of people, right? Really? And, um, then I was gone. Um, wow. Had that, and then it turned into Xanax, then Oxy, then drinking, then then I just I was gone. Um, there was five days where I was locked up in a hotel room, and I woke up to the police trying to pull off the door for a wellness check. Not trying, they were off oh the hinges. Gosh. And so they were real worried about me. I opened the door. Oh, the door was coming off. And, um, uh, you know, I talked to him, told him I was just sleeping. Like, how could you not hear us? You know? And, yeah. um, I was passed out. And anyways, um, like three or four officers left and then there was like two standing there and, one just reached out and put his hand on my shoulder and said, Hey, is there anything we can do for you? He goes, this isn't the police officer. This is, I forget his name. But I was like, no, there's nothing you can do. And I remember him just looking at me and saying, well, when I get to my car, I'm going to, I'm going to say a prayer for you. And, uh, I said, thanks. I need it. <laughs> and so after that I felt a lot of shame, knew I needed rehab. I confess that I relapsed and everything else. And then, uh, we were looking at sending me to a one in Oklahoma that has a good reputation there, but I knew people that had gone there because I speak and I share my story and I'd been sober four years. And, mm -hmm. um, I just known people that use the whole time they're at the same place. Um, they knew the schedule of when they're getting tested. They got their phones back. They could have visitors any day of the week. I mean, it was dangerous. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. It wasn't fight camp that I needed right. for the biggest fight of my life, um, training camp with coaches. And, yeah, for sure. Yeah. So I tried to talk and say, I want to go to a different place. I want to do some research and they just want to get me in somewhere quick. Um, so it's kind of a no. And, um, and my sponsor, my AA sponsor had just come back from there and said his sponsee was speaking at that treatment center and that half the people were watching South park during his talk when they brought food there for alumni night to share his story of recovery. The other half were on their cell phones in front of him, and the other, like, I don't know, I guess half were watching South park, half were outside smoking and the, just a few people were in front of them with their cell phones. So I was like, that's not for me. Mm -mm. It's not where I'm going. So I made a bad decision and I ended up booking a ticket to Tulum. And, uh, I thought I was going to go to Tulum and just kind of reset and find a place, come back. And was this and, with fit for service? No, no oh, okay. I, I didn't know. You anybody. just went. Okay. Uh, I, I just oh, you were new like service. me. Yeah, That's right. Like you. Mm -hmm. And then, um, wow. I booked this ticket, went down to Mexico. It was four flight attendants, two pilots and me. And I say, I wanted to go reset and recharge my mind, but there was another part of me. I mean, it was a one-way ticket. There was a part of me that was like, I'll come back whenever I need to come back. And another part that was like, probably not coming back. And, um, so I was just in a really dark Holy spot. Holy shit. Really yeah. dark. Yeah. And so four flight attendants, two pilots and me flying down to Mexico. Why didn't they cancel the flight? It was, it was very like, uh, it was a moment that was very dark for me. Almost like, yeah, this makes sense that yeah. it's just me. Um, and I don't want to take many people on this trip with me. You yeah. Know? So. Wow. That's weird. Yeah. Yeah. So got there to Cancun then hit like 10, 12, uh, road, roadblocks till I got to Playa del Carmen and each one took so long that, uh, I just stayed in Playa, ended up meeting some guys with the cartel, um, the bigger drug guys. Oh, um, oh and, my God. Uh, yeah. So How'd that up, go? Oh, I met a guy on the street and then he was trying to sell me drugs and then the amount that I wanted. And then someone wow. came and I think. I don't know how he found out that I was a fighter or wrestler, maybe he asked, or maybe someone that I saw down there. Mm -hmm. but anyways, um, I take a picture with him, but I'm trying to buy drugs with him from him and, uh, stupid. And, um, anyways, he takes me up to a big penthouse, uh, apartment and that they got the whole top floor and there's this big, bad drug dealer guy with like, I don't know. Like, like a, out of a movie. Like a leopard just silk shirt. Perfect. Yeah. I won't, yeah, I wear this in honor. <laughs> yeah, in honor. Of him. But he, uh, he had chains on. He had a, I don't know, a big pool and infinity pool on the rooftop and waterfalls. And I mean, it was like something out of a movie. Yeah, straight up. And ended up buying a bunch of drugs, went back to my place and ended up uh, trying to, yeah, um, 
I don't know. I, so at 13, when I was bullied, I was told at this costume party, um, it was my middle school crush and she invited me to her costume party and winner was going to get a prize. It was going to be a Dr. Pepper gumball machine. And so her dad worked at Dr. Pepper. It's a bigger thing in Texas. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Um, and, uh, so anyways, people were going as Thor and Avengers and Superman, Batman, all that stuff. Mm -hmm. I decided to go as, um, her favorite transformer. So oh, nice she loved move. Optimus Prime. <laughs> and so with some cardboard with my mom, we cut out like a 24 pack on my head, 12 packs on my arms, chest plate, sword, shield. My mom was like, Jennifer's going to love this. Mm -hmm. So we get to her party. Rumors at school were true. There was a Dr. Pepper machine in her house. You just push the button. It pops out. You go right in. And so her grandmother opened the door and go, her name was Mimi. And she goes, Jennifer's going to love this. And so she walked me to the backyard. I get the Dr. Pepper, go to the backyard, open the door. And um, turns out like I get hit with a couple flash of the light. Um, I hear the laughter, my eyes adjust. I see no one else is dressed up. It's just me. And it was all a ploy. It was all like premeditated. And I hear I'm getting hit with some cameras. They're taking pictures of me. They're laughing. And my crush crushed me by saying, I can't believe you thought you were good enough to come to my party. Next to her, Tyler said, you're worthless. And next to him, Justin, the one that organized the whole thing, um, said, you should just kill yourself. So at 13, Oh my the, God. It's yeah. Just, I, I can't even believe that's real. Yeah. Uh, that's sometimes I can't either, but, but hearing other stories around uh, the nation now, yeah, like, I know. there's that a just, lot. And a uh, young man named Raiden, we were able to help last year. Yes. Yeah, so I've, I've followed um, your stories about Raiden. He's incredible. I love that, that dude. I see a lot of myself in him. <sighs> um, you know, I, I wasn't born with autism. I wasn't born deaf in my right ear, uh, but he's a bigger heavy set kid. And that's who I was too. And, so, um, whenever all that was happening, my ex goes, I know why you're doing all this for Raiden. And I said, why? And she said, you're just trying to be the kid, the guy you needed when you were 12. Right. And so, um, you know, that's what I want to be. Uh, but some reason 20 years until recently, till I found fit for service, till I had this spiritual experience with God again, um, you know, suicide and depression has been the biggest battle of my life. Um, well, back to that's Mexico, where the yeah. what happened? So, so I went there and I took, whenever I decided it was going to be kind of over, yeah. I, um, that kind of, um, I took five Oxford Like you were ready 80s. to die. Yeah. You were like, yeah, this I is attempted it. suicide. So this was, it, a, was it because April 5th. of the addiction? Yeah. So when I, when I fell back to the addiction, I thought I'm never going to beat this beast. Like this is. Yeah. This is the opponent that I lose to. And, yeah. uh, and I didn't want to hurt more people than help. And I remembered that phone call to my best or from my best friend, um, missing his wedding. Yeah. Um, you know, just lots of different moments in my life. I have a friend who I, I was on a retreat a year ago and a close friend who battled it for 30 years and, you know, he lost the battle. He shot himself a mm. year ago at age 50 and yeah, yeah. I mean, I think that's how he felt, yeah. you know? So I, I don't know how to really rationalize. You can't rationalize it. It's the most selfish act. I, and I, I, I don't mean that. You do plan. rationalize I mean it at a point though. I've had yeah, some so mine, lows where you're just like the world's better off without me. Yeah. So yeah. mine was the visual I got was with, um, nine 11 when the, when the towers were hit by the mm -hmm. plane Yeah. and there's people above where the smoke is. Right. And they're trapped Yeah. and they can't get down. They don't know how to get down. They've looked, they've been in a dark burning building and they come to a window and like, they don't want to jump, mm -mm. but they don't want to stay in the burning building right? either. So, um, my two choices suck. Yeah. You suck, but this one's, <laughs> so I guess less. I'll pick this one. Yeah. 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 Which is, there's always a third option, you know, live, there, there, breathe, there is, you know, yeah. um, breathe through this. And, um, so anyways, I, I took five Oxy 80s while I was down there, Eight, 80 milligrams. They normally give five or 10 after Holy surgery. Holy shit. So five eighties, if we went to the five milligrams, what is that? Four, 400? 40, yeah, 400. So that's mm -hmm. 80. I think I'm no math. Ways, no, no, but, you, that's yeah. it. And that's 80 <laughs> pills of the five milligrams. Okay. So that's almost Holy three shit. prescription bottles. Okay. So 80 pills um, of Damn. the five milligrams. That should, that'll was, fuck you up. Yeah, kill you. Um, and so I had... Uh, yeah. Well, maybe not because you're alive. Yeah. Well, you're, it's supposed to be. So I, I, I took that, I took five 
um, Xanax five or two milligrams, which is the strongest there is. So mixing Oxy and Xanax is a definite heart stopping combination. Uh, well, at high doses. Yeah. And so this was like the highest doses you could take. And then um, some Coke. I drank like half or three quarters of a bottle of tequila, which I hate tequila. And um, it's one of the, that's the first drink I think I threw up on. Right. So you, you and I, half just, of Texas. Right. So anyways, that's where I, I stopped drinking it. And so I had like half to three quarters of that bottle. I had the five oxy eighties, 400 milligrams, five, two milligrams of the Xanax. And it was just, it was, uh, I was supposed to go out. So, and then I, I bought what I thought was Molly or MDMA, which I had never had. And so, um, I thought about that from him and it was this like crystal form of it that he said was like the pure form and something in my spirit. When I took that, everything was getting dark. Everything was kind of quieting down. I was slowing, kind of numbing mm -hmm. and everything was yeah getting dimmer, darker. And my <sighs> motor skills were like slowing, stopping. And, um, something said like, take that crystal. So I did. And then, um, I pass out. This was maybe noon, 2 PM. Mm -hmm. And I pass out and fall back and, uh, like just my bottom of my legs were hanging off the bed mm -hmm. and I woke up the next morning at like 6 AM. So this is at like noon or 2 PM. I pass out and I don't wake up till 6 AM the next day. Wow. Something like that. And I go and get into the water. And my first thought was like, were you surprised to wake up? Yes. Yeah. That's okay. the, my first thought was shit. I'm still here. Yeah. <laughs> I'm sure. Like, like, like I'm what alive. the fuck? <laughs> yeah. yeah. I'm alive. <laughs> like I'm definitely pretty tough. <laughs> yeah. Well, I, at the time I felt so much shame. Oh, I'm but sure. I, I went out of my room, put my feet in the sand, and um, that was a little grounding, which is a new word for me. And then uh, I go and I get in the water, and I sit in the water, and uh, I feel all this shamefulness over me, but I also start feeling a little bit of gratefulness. It was almost with the waves. It might sound weird to describe, but it was almost like shamefulness was coming over me, but a little bit of gratefulness was was there. Yeah. And then uh, something happened where it was like teeter tottering, going back and forth. And it just kind of switched to where it was almost gratefulness coming over me and shamefulness kind of leaving or going mm -hmm. out. And as that happened, um, you know, I started to connect with my breath, just started being grateful for the breath of my lungs and thinking, you know, almost feeling a heartbeat and like thinking like, wow, I'm so grateful for a beating heart in my chest you know, um, for the breath of my lungs, for this one life I get to live here what now. What a shift for yeah. you, right? Well, like right when I opened my eyes, I just felt like it was time to open my eyes. And when I did, um, it wasn't two seconds later, three seconds tops that the sun all of a sudden started to rise over the horizon. And I'm in the water in Playa del Carmen and I just attempted to take my life and felt so much shame, but then so much gratitude. And Always darkest before the dawn, right? Right. And that, that's literally what I thought was that, um, yeah. Uh, so true. It's a cliche, the morning, but it's so true. Know? Yeah. Yeah. And that was the darkest night of my life, without a doubt. And still here. Yeah. And so I went to treatment and that was really, really good for me. Um, and it was really, really hard too. They kicked out over half the people that came in. It wasn't a place I was trying to keep people. This was wow. a big book boot camp, 12 step completion program. We beat you when you come in and beat you down while you're here and kick you down on, on your way out. They didn't actually beat you, did they? They didn't actually okay. beat us. But <laughs> I mean, it was, it was a military type. Uh, it was the last resort lost cause place. And I could have gone to Scottsdale or Malibu or mm -hmm. LA to these places that wake me up with a green smoothie uh -huh. or something. And, but that's not <laughs> what I needed. I needed like, uh, some hard truth and, and some like 90 days of up at 5 a.m., not in bed until 11 and one break during the day. Yeah. And uh, except to eat. And we're cooking the meals, cleaning the meals for 32 men. I'm fixing their breakfast every day, 60 eggs, Stand 120. Busy. Hell yeah. Yeah. And so it was, it was really good and freeing. I went in there and looked at a lot of the like childhood trauma I've had. And one of the things that really helped was maybe I could connect the dots real quick between the, what actually happened in the water, um, in Mexico to like what happened in the water, I guess, in Sedona. Mm -hmm. Um, we did this breath work and I had this, yes, I had this I talked about on my first episode. Yeah. Yes. The breath work, which was intensely powerful. Right. 
Yeah, I, I don't know what happened in your breath work, so I'm excited to hear. Um, again, oh. if people don't know, it's uh, Anahata who leads a shamanjelic uh, ceremony mm. that we participated in of right. just breath work. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And that's all it was, was meditative breathing. Mm -hmm. But they said, set an intention, and I wrote down loved, um, that I would feel self-love, because love's been something I've given away a lot, but I've never really received much of uh, it's been given to me. I just haven't received it. I haven't actually, it's like a gift, right? You got to open it up and, mm -hmm. and receive it. And I never felt worthy of that. So I uh, wrote down loved. And then um, were you, what group were you in the first, second, second. or third? I was in the second. Oh, we were in the same we were one. In the same one. Yeah. Oh, Do you remember the water? Uh, Aubrey's water not working at the ranch. Yes, yeah. that's right. The water yeah. didn't work that water day. Water didn't work that day. Right. We weren't able to use the toilets or the sinks <clears throat> yes. or anything. Mm -hmm. And he told a story about a rainmaker mm -hmm. and that we're all, we can all be rainmakers. And that's part of my story is I, I want to be a rainmaker for people, bring clean water to people that don't have it. That's right. And so I think we're providing water for like 60,000 plus people a day. Um, oh my God. And that's so powerful. Through water wells and 73, 72 water wells now. Well, this simple thing that we take for and, granted right? all the time. Yeah. yeah. And it can literally not just change, but save lives yes. and, and transform them and set people free from slavery. I've seen that happen. Yeah. 1,651 wow. people from negotiating using clean water for even their slave masters who don't have access to clean water. Wow. Been to five funerals of their kids. Um, and so if you can change that by bringing clean water to them, I'm all over the place here, but that's like, okay. The no, we're going back was, to it. Was, um, was our blue chip like bargaining tool for wow. people's freedom. Uh, wow. Yeah. So, and something that them and their slave masters would walk six miles, like each way to, so 12 miles round trip, um, is dirtier than the water we give our dogs or we use the restroom. In. Right. And so, um, anyways, Aubrey was talking about how the well broke that they don't know when it was going to be turned back mm -hmm. on and fixed. And he told the story about a rainmaker who brought water to places that needed it. And anyways, uh, we go into the breath work. I start breathing. Aubrey comes down. He gets on his hands and knees and he puts his hands on my heart and uh, we're breathing and everyone's eyes are closed and there's some of the, the drums or the music and different things. And Aubrey's a facilitator and he puts his hand on my chest and says, what's this armor over your heart? Um, would you, Wow. yeah, he goes, would you, would you drop it? Would you, would you let yourself be completely seen by your creator? And um, why is there this guard up? Can you soften? Can you allow them in? And so I just kind of visualize seeing like my heart and armor kind of falling off of it. And I can visualize from wrestling, right? I had sports psychologists that would always take us through visualization drills. See yourself in the match a hundred times before you ever go and do it. And I'm do big it exactly, on visualizing. Right? Yes. So it's powerful. But this was, this was the second vision I've had in my life. Um, but I, that was not trying to conjure something up, not trying to make something happen. It just came yeah. like download kind of style. Yeah. The heart kind of armor fell off the heart. And then all of a sudden I was back and breathing, listening to him, breathe in, breathe out, breathe in, breathe out. And then, um, I just all of a sudden was taken to this vision where I see the vast ocean and it's dark and there's clouds covering the sky. And it's just this darkness, almost like this perfect storm brewing coming in and the waters are dark, the clouds are dark. And all of a sudden I see this darkened, hardened heart that's floating on the surface of the ocean. And it looked like a human heart it was or a human was it heart, like yeah. a heart shape? Okay. No, it was a, Sorry. it was a like anatomically I need to get correct. my vision. No, you're, okay. you're great. It's, it was a darkened, <laughs> almost, aorta, there's chambers. Yeah, like a dark red, blackish heart. Okay. Um, and it starts to sink. And it's um, sinking, it's drowning, it's dying, and it's just, uh, yeah, uh, sinking to the bottom. And it's, I don't know, 100, 200 feet deep, something It's pretty deep. And uh, as the heart's falling, I literally feel like um, pressure on my chest, like almost like as if I was going to the bottom of a pool. Um, and as it gets deeper, I feel more tightness and I feel like this is my heart where it was six months ago on April 5th. Right. And I'm just watching and one of the facilitators comes by with some of the water and they like kind of sprinkle or spritz some water. And I was in a spot where the kind of the sun started hitting my face a little. So maybe they were doing that for that. But right whenever they sprinkle that water on me, the second they do, 
um, I see at the surface of the ocean this this dive of this golden, gorgeous water. And the water is starting to swim straight down towards my heart. And it's doing this gorgeous pattern of like this fast but beautiful swim, I guess. It was on a rescue mission, I guess. And yeah. so it right before my heart hit the bottom of the ocean floor, where I knew it would be dead and gone, like it was caught by the the golden water. It started to encapsulate it and gross it and swirl around it. And there's just this beautiful healing water on my heart, but it started to swim up. And so it swam up. And as it got to the surface, like my chest started to literally like relieve. And I could take deeper breaths again. And um, and I just felt like I was supposed to put my hands up. So I put my hands up. And when I do, um, just to kind of take a deeper breath, I'm seeing in like in the vision, this heart being swirled with this golden, gorgeous water. Then all of a sudden it turns into like this fire of love. And it's this fire going around the heart. And then I can see this white, bright light orb, like an orb of light, um, almost like a little sunshine around the heart. Yeah. And I have my hands up and I'm breathing and, um, and they grab my wrist and they pull them back. And so they pull my hands over my head and they're helping me stretch or breathe deeper. And when they do that, um, I feel like they put like a medicine ball almost in my hand, which I know sounds kind of crazy, but a real medicine ball that you work out with felt like someone placed that in my hand, which was real strange. I've got my eyes closed, but then it goes from the golden, gorgeous water to then this fire of love to then this, um, orb of white light. And when that orb hits, it literally starts pushing back the clouds, um, to where they start coming like blue skies. And then the water starts to turn from this darkened stormy water to like this crystal blue, like Caribbean water, like kind of going out from it. And then I see this molten golden, like goldsmithing gold and, uh, and it comes over the heart and it's this heart of gold and it starts to like solidify from like this liquid warm state. And um, whenever that medicine Damn. ball felt like it was put there, I put it over my head uh -huh. and I put it back over my head because it was literally getting heavy. And I felt like this, this energy or this oh ball of light or this warmth in between my hands, no matter how hard I tried to push my hands together, I couldn't do it. Push to the left with my right hand. My left hand came out, push to the, the right fuck? with my left hand what and my right fuck? hand would go out. It was crazy. <laughs> and, um, anyways, I, 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 have my hands there and the facilitator grabs my hands, put them over each other. And they start to put that, my hands back on my chest. Well, when they did that, I know this sounds a little woo woo or out there, but you know what? I'm, when, I'm right there. Okay. It's fine. <laughs> when, when the hands came down into my chest, like it felt like there was this warm liquid honey that just sunk into my chest, yeah. like all around my heart. Um, maybe kind of, yeah. In my lungs. Even. Just like touched by divine love. Yeah. And I, I, I started to tear up and tears started streaming down my face. And I just thought back to like, that's the difference between like April 5th and April 6th, yeah. like April 5th, I was drowning desperate in a dangerous place, despised myself. And like, I was dying in this darkness, drowning in it. Yeah. Um, and then like, I don't know, I woke up yeah. and that's whenever that, uh, that golden, gorgeous water, whatever, just went on that rescue mission, breathed life back into me, I think. And, yeah. um, and I, I got to see that sunrise and it was just like, wow, most gorgeous sunrise I've ever seen. Yeah. So that's I, incredible. Yeah. I was just reading today in Turning Pro by Stephen Pressfield and I thought of you and just thought of us talking about epiphanies and these mm. spiritual giant things that can happen. And he wrote in Turning Pro, I'm, I have it here and I meant, to, I meant to have it with me, but basically, so I'll paraphrase. It said um, that, you know, these spiritual epiphanies and these spiritual turning arounds that we experience are, are can, can be so dark and push us to mm. our just very fucking lowest. Right. Right. You know, and, and, and then we just come out brighter. Mm. And that's what the breath work did for me. Like it pushed me into this dark shit that needed to come out yeah. and then got me way, way lighter. Mm. And maybe that was just, you know, this reliving for you that was like of that dark, dark night of the soul, yeah. literally. Yeah, I agree. So one of the fit for service people said that I needed to 
just research some dream and vision kind of interpretation stuff. Was that but Eric? It sounds like. No, no, it, it, no, it wasn't. <laughs> okay. It was Traven and Traven's awesome. But he started telling me that the, each of those symbols have like a real meaning. Mm-hmm. And you're saying like the dark water when someone's drowning or um, sinking or uh, in a vision, a lot of times it's grief, it's sorrow, um, depression, things like that. I was like, whew. Yeah, that's what I was thinking in uh, the first, you know, five months of the year. Yeah. Um, was thinking in that uh, depression and addiction, uh, the grief of like losing people, the grief of my own addiction and feeling like enslaved to that. Like I've seen people literally freed from actual slavery today, like in today's world. There's more slaves on earth than ever in human history, 40 million plus. And, um, and I've only seen, you know, 1600 people. Small fraction of that. Mm -hmm. Um, but I've seen the real deal, like real, like liberation and new land and water and food and kids going to school for the first time and seen some incredible, amazing miracles happen. People getting clean water for the first time. Yeah. The feeding giants of, of disease, not just giants of depression, but disease that's actually killing people. And, uh, when the water comes out and hits the dirt or fills up a cup or whatever, like that sound to me is the sound of a battlefield and a giant being taken out and hitting the dirt, you know, and that, that thud, but it's just water instead. And, um, yeah. So to not be able to break free from my own addiction, that's seemingly self, uh, inflicted, even though it's not, um, there's just this actual disease that's taken place. But, yeah. um, well, speaking yeah, of water, yeah. You know, I, that was one thing that I kind of wanted to touch on with you was about, you know, finding flow versus fighting. Mm. You know, we mentioned this off the air before we started and yeah. I wanted to touch on like, um, cause you were fighting the addiction, but also finding a flow within yourself mm. and finding a flow within your heart. And, um, I just, I like, you know, wondered how you've shifted in your view about that or has that come up for you? Even having all this water imagery is really interesting for you, yeah. I think. Yeah, I, I guess water is my not spirit animal, but it's something. It's you know, water it's, can be your yeah. spirit animal. Water's you know my spirit Who's animal. Who's making rules sure. on that? Sure, we're going <laughs> to call it. I like it's it. your spirit Bruce, element. Okay, spirit, spirit, spirit element. element. I love that. Mm-hmm, I just made it up. Thank you. Yeah, you're welcome. I love that. It should be a thing. It's going to be. It's my thing now. <laughs> Good. It's our thing. Well, you know, it, um, it, well, it's interesting to look at, you know, how many times we won't surrender right. and we fight our own inner things when, if we would just find that fucking flow hmm. and lean into that, like you said, you know? So I might have something, you might've just spurred something for me. Okay, um, good. So the flow, there's a jujitsu flow state, but- in martial arts, Bruce Lee would say, be like water. Why be like two rocks coming together right. and just colliding? Mm-hmm. Both get damaged um, and where the stronger one wins, but it takes a beating too. So flow around those things, wherever the resistance is. Yes. You don't have to lean into the resistance always. And being from a wrestling background, you kind of always do. You do? Uh, a lot of times. I don't know shit about wrestling. Um, well, I mean, you don't. <laughs> Which uh, I'm sure shocks you. You, <laughs> you, you use <clears throat> their body weight and um, positioning against them. You know, mm-hmm. it's position before submission. You have to have good positioning before you go for a submission in jujitsu. But in wrestling, like you get away with more strength. Like I'm a strong farm boy, strong guy. So I mm-hmm. can like pick guys up and throw them and things like that. Um, but... Yeah, it's it's a whole other thing whenever you use their body weight against them, almost like judo, where it's all technique. You don't even have to use strength. Mm-hmm. Um, and so I guess in the jiu-jitsu flow state, it's like, so I'm making a comeback into fighting. It's been a few years, a couple of years, because I had a shoulder surgery. And then the addiction and the divorce and all this mm-hmm. life stuff. But coming back, I was trying to set a, a date on the calendar. This is when I'm going to fight. And my coach, uh, who's an on it guy, um, Rafael Lovato Jr., he's the most accomplished American to ever do the sport of jiu-jitsu. So 12 world medals, six-time world champion. Wow. And he's the undefeated MMA world champion, never lost a fight. Damn. Um, he's been on Joe's. I've got him on there a couple of times. And yeah. Great guy. But whenever I was talking to Rafael, I was like, I want to fight February or March. And he's like, or actually I told him December 1st. He goes, no, don't even think about fighting in 2020. Just, just think about feeling good 
getting back in the flow, enjoying it. Don't put all this pressure of circling a date on the calendar, which I always thrive under. Yeah. Um, and push myself to the extremes. He goes, well, maybe you're pushing yourself too much. Maybe you need to pull back. You've got all this stuff going on. Yeah. Like you were just fighting fall, against yeah. like allowing that mm -hmm. flow. He's like, just fall in love so with too it many. Again. No, <laughs> that's, that's it. Like, fall in love with the flow and just get here, be consistent, love it, enjoy it, have fun. And whenever I started doing that, um, a couple months ago, I just came in and started enjoying training after 14 years being a professional fighter, wow. just came back in and said, I'm gonna have fun. This dad that's got three kids that train here that I sometimes train with, but most of the time don't cause uh -huh. we're kind of at two different levels. And, um, you know, he's doing it for fun. I'm mm -hmm. doing it for my job. Uh, you know what? I started training with a lot more of those guys. And I started just having a blast with it, teaching them things, showing them things, being shown things, learning from guys that maybe you wouldn't normally think you're going to learn from, but a martial artist, a true martial artist has a humble heart that wants to learn yeah. and grow. And so they'll take it from anyone that they can get it from, but also give to. And so I'll share something with them that is, has always helped me the last 14 years proven, but they have this little spin on it that I'm like, that actually might work in competition. Mm -hmm. So they're showing me something I might be able to use and I'm able to help them fine tune oh, that's it also. That's flow right there. Yeah. I'm, I'm so into that concept. I've been into it like the last few months, just this idea of work hard versus work easy. Mm. And, I, and I don't mean, I don't mean you don't put in the effort, but I just mean if you're working hard, there's something resistant about mm -hmm. that. But if you can, just like you're saying with what, you know, you were doing in the um, training, you know, you're working, you're working easier because you want to be there and you're having fun with it. And I, yeah. I'm like, I, even this show and what I'm doing with my voice, I'm like, you know what, I'm working easy. Like this is, it feels so right. It's mm -hmm. flowing. Like when you messaged me yesterday, I'm like, yes, this is in flow. This is the, yeah. this is the work easy. And you just trust. There's yeah. just this huge element of trust. And do you think uh, that's probably the nature of flow is just like leaning into that trust? Yeah. Yeah. I think so. Mm -hmm. uh, whenever I just trusted and said, whatever Aubrey's up to with fit for service, I need to do that. I feel called to it. Yeah. Um, which I had not even heard about it until, uh, when did we go to Sedona? We went to Sedona like October 15th. Okay. Mm -hmm. So the end of September, beginning of October was when I reached out to Aubrey and he responded right away. Claire called me and then um, and Christian called in. me and then I was booking a trip to Sedona and I hadn't even heard of fit for service until that you day. You know what? I, I did it on a whim too. Yeah. Like I had never, I didn't, I didn't knew nothing about it. I had never heard of it. And one day I was just like, I am looking for something to go further. Right. And they were like taking applications for like two more days. And I was just, I was just looking at Instagram and there's, it popped up and I was like, that looks interesting. And I just started clicking and literally applied right then. And yeah. I was like, well, we'll see if it's, I literally like in my application, I'm like, if this is aligned and in flow, then I'm interested. But if it's not on both sides, then let's not, you know, and, and I just told them what I was looking for and well, here we are. Yeah, <laughs> so, awesome. I mean, I like literally got in like the next day and I was like, huh, okay, yeah. well, I'm going to trust that this is where I'm supposed to be. And right. now I'm just so grateful for the breakthrough after breakthrough that I feel like I'm yeah. getting with these. With Me this. too. Yeah. It's just I, and I spiritually think amazing. It is. And I think flow comes from community a lot. It does. Um, yeah. It's hard to be in a flow on your own um, or at least like maximum like flow. But that's been a big lesson of trust for me too. And mm. even you, like when you're in that community of training, mm. you know, or me sitting here with Michael and Colton and, you know, whoever else is here in this capacity and like, like I've been on my own for mm. so long and being able to lean into that community right. and trusting that you're exactly where you're fucking supposed to be. <laughs> <laughs> I love that. That is, uh, that is, that is where I've been working hard to just get to. And I forget and I forget and I, then I remember and then I forget and then I remember. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. That's so great. It's so great. It's so good. Well, I, <clears throat> just what? real quick on community. Yes. Tell me. That's something that I really learned from the pygmy people that I was so lacking in homesick for whenever I came back home, it was such culture shock. You know, I held some kids, buried them, um, that yeah, had died and like, yeah. just, just seeing some really tough stuff and coming back and seeing a mom and a daughter about to go to Haiti on like a humanitarian trip. And they're like arguing in Atlanta at Popeye's because she wants a Coke <laughs> and her mom wants her to drink water. And she's Make, like, there's not going to be Coke in Haiti. It takes the trivialness of everything right? like to a like, different level. You're I'm, like, I literally was come back and I'm like, 
I wanted to grab them both sweetly, <laughs> mm-hmm. but grab them and be like, with love, gently, just saying like, love each other. Shake, shake, this shake. This is over sugar water. <laughs> yes. And mom, I agree with you. But at the same time, mm-hmm. like, uh, because mm-hmm. it ended up where the girl stormed out of Popeye's <laughs> because the mom grounded her for two weeks before the two weeks? Her trip. Yeah. Oh, God. Um, because she wasn't listening to her. Yeah. Yeah. It's and so then, easy to lose your perspective. And then all of a sudden it turned into, I hate you. And no. They walked out of the, instead of loving each other, going to Haiti to help people, they're like hating each other or, you know, not hating, but saying it. Yeah. And then, um, saying words you can't take back. Yeah. And literally I had just come back from bearing a little boy. Oh my um, God. And, uh, and so I think what I learned from them there is that if you, there's a few Swahili proverbs, but one is if you want to go fast, go alone. But if you want to go far, go together. And like how much further we can go together. And even that for me and my addiction, whenever that's active and um, I'm alone, I hardly ever use with people. Um, It's almost always by myself or one or two others that are using as well. And I feel alone, isolated, sedating, suppressing, ignoring, escaping, all that other stuff. But like truly like life's best whenever we're living it together. And um, that's the only way we can go far in life. It's not a sprint. It's a marathon. Mm -hmm. We need each other and we need to be open and vulnerable and share like what we're struggling with, what our shit is. Big time. Um, And I mean, that's what opening your heart is, right? mm -hmm. It's opening up and allowing yourself to love and receive that love like you talked about earlier, you know? Which sounds so simple (laughs) and damn it, it should be, you know, but we make it more complicated than it has to be. And we hold back and, Mm. um, that's such a beautiful message. I love that Swahili proverb. Mm. Yeah. And one of the things I've learned a lot in only six or seven weeks with being with this tribe at Fit for Service is, wow. People can love themselves and not be like stuck up or arrogant or cocky or prideful. Like there's some people that have done so much deep work that are all around me. Like I've done work that you read a bio and that right. might, that might impress right. some people. But right. That, that's not but the that real doesn't work. Imp- impact. Like mm-hmm. it's a bio that can right. go in one ear out the other, but like you impact people by your presence and um, by truly seeing them and being seen and like some of these people that I'm around, they've done so much deep work on themselves that they've healed so much. They're able to help others heal in a way that like, even just being around them and seeing like, man, that person loves that person so much, but they're also in love with themselves, mm-hmm. not in this cocky, arrogant way, but in a healthy way. Yeah. That, um, in a healthy worthiness way, yes. you know, and like recognizing my own worthiness. And yeah. it's been a huge journey for me just in the last year. And I've, yeah, I've just been putting in the work and now people notice and it takes, you know, it takes shape and it, mm. it, it, it matters so much in my life. And I'm like, yeah. no one can take this from me. Right. Mm-mm. Right. And I think it might not around the world I'm in with fit for service, but maybe on the outside that might rub some or rustle some feathers like so, from people that are insecure. They just need to love themselves more. Right? Yeah, no, that's what I was saying. It was a mirror. I it was mean, a mirror to them about like <laughs> that person can't be that happy or that person can't love themselves or other people that right. much. And mm-hmm. man, I just, I just have seen love be contagious. And um, you know what's so awesome is that the nonprofit Fight for the Forgotten in our, our, mm-hmm. our mission in schools now We've impacted over 100,000 students live in our first time putting together an assembly. We had a girl come down that had completed her suicide letter right before our assembly. We do like a 90 minute show with like hip hop artists and DJ booth and like spoken word artists and poets and um, dancers uh, that are like BET and Badass. MTV choreographers and Badass. smoke machines. They, they love it. It's music mm-hmm. that they love, that they're engaged yeah, with. Yeah. They're dancing, they're laughing and crying. Um, so we have four breakout speakers that are real powerful and really meet the students where they're at so that we can't just relate, but don't just relate, but connect also mm-hmm. and impact. But this girl literally said, because you guys were here today, I'll be here tomorrow, you know? And um, right. so that makes life so much more worth it. Right. And to go through the darkness to then see other people break free from theirs. Oh yeah. That gets me. Mm -hmm. (laughs) 
Yes. And that is, it's all about this love yeah. and defeating that hate mm. with love, even if it's self hate. Yeah. You know, because I mean, we all suffer from that sometimes. Yeah. From time to time, I know I have. Mm. And so what a beautiful message. Well, is there anything else that you feel called to share before we go? No, I I, I do get messages often when I don't remember to state it. Um, If anyone that wants to support or go to our website, fightforthefreeon.org, we've got t-shirts on there. 100% of the proceeds go to the I'm going to get one. I need a t-shirt. Well, thanks. They're they're pretty great t-shirts, actually. Yes, they Um, look amazing. If they feel You're comfy. modeling them. I'll oh, yeah? model one. Okay, thanks. I'll model one for you. You'll Hell help us yeah. sell some. That'd be great. Okay, you got it. <laughs> and, um, 100%. Yeah, and if people want to donate, they can do it one time. They can become a monthly donor. Um, if you just want to help share a message, you can do that. On um, That was the first promise I made to the Pygmy Chief was that I can't help with land, water, food. But he said, we don't have a voice. Can you help us have one? I said, yes, because he goes, everyone else calls us the forest people, but we call ourselves the forgotten people. Wow. And so that's what, what we exist to do is let people know they're not forgotten, that they're loved. Um, whether that's for the most oppressed people group on earth, the pygmies, or whether that's in our own schools or on social media, wow. we've been able to impact 22 million online so far. So oh that's my what we're trying God. to do. Hey. You're fucking such a fucking <laughs> badass. Uh, oh, I got a great team. That's for sure. That well, community. that community, right? Yeah. It matters. But you know what? Just your message and what you're sharing, what you're putting out there. And I know that team is probably inspired by you every single hmm. minute. And I am. And I'm just so Thank grateful you. to just know you and be able to share your message. How lucky am I to get to share this? So thank you. Thank you so much. And of course I'm going to put links to everything up so everyone can find you. Um, big pig me on Instagram and you've got all links up there too, including fight for the forgotten.org and anything else. Right. So, well, just thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. And I encourage everybody to find you and connect because you're just a beautiful soul. And Mm -hmm. uh, I'm just trying to make sure I didn't forget anything else. Just thank you, Justin. I love you. Thank you. I love you. Mm -hmm. Yeah. You're amazing. Thank you. Okay, massive thanks to Justin Wren for being here with us and sharing his story. So grateful. So now let's just dip into a little bit more of his daily habits right now. Okay, Justin, thank you for sitting back down with me for just a couple minutes because I completely forgot to ask and touch on this. So uh, a big part of like rebirth for me and loving myself is loving myself enough to have and cultivate daily habits. So yeah. I forgot to ask you your daily habits or if you have any like regular practices, cause I wanted to share that with people. Yeah. So I always try to have a gratitude list, um, every day. Like and list is that on your phone? Where or, is it? Well, there, I have a few different options, okay. so it depends on how much time I have. Okay. But, uh, I have the five minute journal that I keep a lot. And so it's just three minutes a morning, two minutes at night. But you start with three things that you're grateful for. Then you go right into three things that would make today great. And then you start with a positive affirmation, I am. And then you fill out a sentence or two. And then at the evening, there's a nightly review. And then you go and basically say, what were three amazing things that happened today? And then you end with just, how could I have made today better? And so I try to do that one almost every day. Oh my God, I totally need to do that. Yeah. I mean, three things I was grateful for today was you. Mm -hmm. I mean, this show, this Mm -hmm. opportunity. Another one was Hot Pie Media, just because they might extend an opportunity or have extended an opportunity mm-hmm. for me to do a podcast here. Mm-hmm. So I'll figure that out. And then also, um, you know, another was my friend's life, Brian, mm-hmm. who you knew or, or I knew and supported me through uh, the loss of him and uh, leaving behind his four boys and his wife, Gina. And so I try to really personalize it to each and every day and something that's meaningful uh, to me. And so. I always start off with gratitude. Then I have this, which is a full focus planner. Um, and it just kind of helps me focus my day. I have. Is that what it's called? A full focus planner? The full focus planner. Let me see it. It's from Michael Hyatt. Uh, Michael Hyatt. Kind of a CEO of CEOs. Oh, sorry. You're good. Cool. Oh, it's and, got quotes uh, in there. I yeah, like every it. Every day it's got quotes. Uh, uh-huh. It's got Oops, 10 sorry. annual goals that you start the year with. Oh, wow. Um, and then I still need to fill that out since it's the beginning <laughs> yes. of the year. Um, and then. I yeah have a daily big three every week. You start off with your big three of the week. And then every day you have a, you know, my three biggest things that are going to get me towards those 10 annual goals that you break down into three. Like uh, actionable basic, items. Yes. Kinda. And also uh, quarterly goals. So these three I'm focused on for this year. Mm-hmm. I have 10 goals, but then I have a main three that I focus on these next three months. Mm-hmm. And then I have three weekly goals 
Um, and then I have three daily things that I got to get done to get towards those goals. Have you done those things even when you were training? Yeah. Or are these like yeah. new, newer practices? These no, are that- these are things that I've been doing. I mean, I had two Olympic gold medalists as my high school coaches, mm-hmm. um, and they would always have us break things down, be goal oriented, to be working towards something. That sense of accomplishment is something that, you know, uh, from the smallest thing to the biggest thing, mm-hmm. um, you want to celebrate those. And that's what's pretty cool about this journal or this planner is that whenever you write down your annual goals, you break each one down and you have goal details. Is this a habit goal that you can track and you have a habit tracker, just like you and I both have the James Clear clear habit, habit tracker. tracker. Mm-hmm. Um, and then, uh, also in this, you can do that. Uh, but you also have a reward at the end, mm-hmm. you know, what are the, what are the things I need to do next? So you break those down into bite sized bits to mm-hmm. get towards that goal. And then when I accomplish that goal, you know, how am I going to celebrate it? You know, how am I going to reward myself or how am I going to celebrate with others? Because I mean, after a big wrestling tournament or a big fight, you want to celebrate, you know, so the after party is always something I want to celebrate and it's not anymore to just numb out and uh, party. Now it's, I want to celebrate it with really good people. And so the people that helped get me there, my training camp, the, the warriors that got me there, but my family, Mm -hmm. uh, my friends, my mentors, uh, the people that care about me that add to my life. I want them there to celebrate them helping me get there because even though, even though you're a fighter and you're standing in there alone and kind of the weight all rests on you, my friends, my family, my coaches, my training partners, they are more nervous for me than I ever could be when I'm in there fighting. They care about me. They love me. Some of them are watching, you know, through their fingers. I, I can so imagine. I want, I want to invite them in on a celebration. Yeah. And a yeah. conscious celebration too is modeling to the universe that you're inviting more of the same in. So yeah. yeah not absolutely. to be neglected right. in your habits. So beautiful. Thank you so much for sharing those. Yeah. Anything else? No, I, uh, I just always try to be grateful every day because I mean, grateful for the breath of my lungs, the beating heart, my chest. I try to acknowledge the people I'm grateful for, the opportunities I'm grateful for. And I think that adds to your life and to this world and to other people's lives to show that gratitude. And so oh, it does. And Joe Dispenza says that, you know, scientifically it's proven to boost immuno, immunoglobulin A, which is tied to our immune system. Wow. I know. So you're healthier. I memorized that word too. Are you impressed? I am. I am impressed. I'm going to try it. (laughs) I don't even know if I said it right. (laughs) Well, thank you for, thank you. Speaking of gratitude, thank Mm. you for just taking a couple extra minutes to do this. Absolutely. Thank you. Awesome. Thank you so much to Justin Wren. Remember that you can find his incredible foundation at fightfortheforgotten.org and you can. Follow him at The Big Pygmy on Instagram. Well worth the follow. Uh, So I just want to say a huge thank you for being here today. I mean, I'm so incredibly grateful. So just to wrap up a little bit, as we talked about habits and rebirth and self-love, I think the rebirth of yourself looking ahead, looking, living in the now and looking ahead is about loving yourself enough to do that. And if I can just give one affirmation for today, I think it's that one that I mentioned in the intro. I think it's about living according to your value and living according to your own love and loving and valuing yourself enough to say that the daily actions I choose to take reflect that every single day. And that's just going to create ripples throughout your life. When you're choosing you, when you're choosing to live according to your value and your self-love, I mean, that's going to, that's going to build good habits, period. No question. Right. And I mean, 80% of the time, (laughs) that's what matters. As long as you do it more often than not, that's my philosophy anyway. And I think that it's also cool to take away this power of breath work today like I talked about in last week's episode, and then we talked about with Justin, like how powerful is our breathing? Are you spending time breathing? (laughs) Well, you're spending time breathing. Yeah. But are you spending time consciously breathing? Like what if you had some breath work? And I am going to put something up on my website for free, a little bitty breath work with me. When I say little bitty, I mean like 10, 15 minutes. So that's going to be free on my website. You can go access that anytime you want and download the MP3 at amyedwards.com. So I'm so excited to be able to offer these meditations and things to you because they matter so much in my life. Like they become such a... 
go to. Even when I'm going for a walk, sometimes I'll just listen to a meditation. And when you do that work on yourself, that's where the real change happens, right? The change that we want to see in the world is, I know it's a cliche, but it's true. (laughs) Things are cliches often because they're true. And it's about doing that inner work, right? So you want to listen to a political podcast or some kind of bullshit, whatever, maybe tune that out. Maybe allow yourself just to listen to a meditation and see what happens. Maybe allow yourself to download the breath work and see what happens, right? Because it can be very, very powerful for us. So I just want to say thank you. So go there, access tons of free stuff on my website. There's all sorts of other free resources too that you can download there at amyedwards.com. So check that out. And then of course, please reach out to me at amy at amyedwards.com. If you have any thoughts, anything you want to say, I'm hoping to be reading some listener emails too in these wrap ups. So I'm very excited about that. So please email me and please also... If this spoke to you in any way, share it with a friend, rate, review, and yes, subscribe. That all matters in the podcasting world. You know, it like moves people up. It makes a difference. So just thank you for maybe spending another 10, 30 seconds on something like that, even a quick review, a quick five stars and a subscribe. I would so be grateful if you hit that. So thank you so much. And also Hot Pie Media has tons of great content, so many amazing shows. One that I want to just mention right now is called Strong. Strong is an in-depth look at Me Too and system systemic misogyny and exploitation. And it's ultra powerful, especially, you know, as we keep moving ahead in getting these stories heard. So I encourage you to check out all the great hot pie content and subscribe to those as well. So thank you so much for being here. In closing, I always just offer you from my heart, peace, love, health, wealth, abundance, just the good stuff, all of it to you, to me, to everyone, to reverberate reverberate everywhere out into our lives. So love to you. And here's to transformation and rebirth. See you next time. Thanks for listening. You can find more episodes and all other Hot Pie Media originals baked fresh daily at our home on the web at hotpiemedia.com, the Hot Pie Media YouTube channel, or wherever you listen to podcasts.